All right, so we're good. So uh, over to Anusha. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think a few people's uh, audios are on, so if no, you could if mute you it, mind, it yeah. If you don't mind, uh, please uh, switch off your video and your mics. And uh, as usual, at the end of the session, we'll have the Q&A. Please post your questions in the chat. Thank you all. Yeah, no. Okay, let me share. Okay. Okay, you can see that, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can move it, okay. All right. Um, I'm so glad uh, to see you all here. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's always wonderful to talk to Nama Chennai audience. Um, so I'm going to tell you about some of the work that I did in my PhD with hummingbirds. And there are some graphs and some slightly technical scientific things. But if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please note your comments and ask me in the end. Uh, Tell you a little bit about my past, a little bit to give you context. Uh, I wasn't born in Chennai, but I spent a lot of my childhood in Chennai. Uh, this is me when I was growing up. And uh, yeah, I am sorry. <laughs> the, with the audio is on. Um, so this is me on the left teaching my uh, grandfather how to dance and spending some time with my family on the right. Uh, I went to Stella Maris and I did my bachelor's in zoology. And uh, I did a bunch of internships in India to get more experience, and I'm really glad that I did that. So if there's any students on here, get as much experience as you can before this path to take next. Good option. Sorry, there's a number of audios on. I yeah. think it might be hard for other people to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you please, uh, yeah. Okay. okay, so then I went to Assam and I did a, a internship with the Wildlife Trust of India and I studied these beautiful hula gibbons, um, one of whom was being rehabilitated into the wild. Um, and I did an internship at I IISC with the Indian Academy of Sciences. I then did uh, my master's in Pondicherry University and I spent some time in the field in Maharashtra studying these uh, incredible birds, hornbills, uh, which nest in tree cavities. And um, I also volunteered for some time in Agumbe and followed these king cobras. So, I mean, my point in telling you all this is that there's so much you can do in India and in it, without going out of the South really. Uh, and there's so much experience you can get uh, I also volunteered at the Cro Crocodile Bank for a year. So right next to home, uh, me and a lot of people who, who were my juniors and my seniors volunteered at Crocodile Bank, and that was our kind of start into ecology. Uh, so then I moved to uh, New York for my PhD uh, to a town called Stony Brook. And then I moved to Fairbanks, Alaska for my postdoc uh, a little over a year ago, and I'm still a postdoc there. So I'm doing some postdoctoral research, and then, uh, as Vijay sir said, I'll be moving to Cornell in August. So this is how it looks in Fairbanks. For those of you who are curious, in the winter, uh, there's sometimes three feet of snow, and they just like leave it there and they drive on it, and uh, it gets to minus 40, minus 50 sometimes Celsius. So um, and then it all melts, and then this is how it is in the spring. Um, I learned new things about myself by being in such a cold place. I learned that my hair can freeze is a very strange thing to, to see. It's like seeing yourself age prematurely. Um, but let me rewind a little bit and go back to my Stony Brook time. So uh, this is where this is where Stony Brook is uh, on the map. And it taught me that we think of ecologists as people who spend their lives tra traipsing outdoors and enjoying being outside. But really, most of my job is sitting at a computer, as Vijay sir and I were discussing earlier. Um, 
I have to read papers and I have to write lots of things. And that's really the majority of my time as an ecologist. Um, but I also do get to go to the field. And this is one of my field sites in Arizona. And I also go to Ecuador. And so this is a high elevation site in the Andes of Ecuador. And this is a lower mid elevation site uh, where we had to take use um, mules to take our equipment up to the hills because it was such an isolated site. But we got to see beautiful views like this uh, cloud forest view here where the clouds rose in the afternoon and blanket the whole scene. Um, so if you dive under those clouds, you can see birds. And uh, these are what we we'll focus on for the rest of the talk. So you can see that they're moving extremely fast. They're extremely small. And because uh, they're using energy so quickly to, to hover and to stay um, you know, in flight, they barely can store any fat. So you and I have lots of fat reserves to, um, for a rainy day in case we don't get food to kind of buffer ourselves. But the hummingbirds don't have that. They will die if they don't eat in a few hours. And so they're really living on this uh, knife edge energetically between life and death. Uh, if they don't get food, they can really very easily die. So to give you a sense of how quickly they use energy, uh, there's this infographic. So if you imagine an average human like Matt Damon, who is eight, 84 kilograms, if he had to eat only Lay's chips to survive, he would need about 15 packets of Lay's chips every day. If he, at that same weight, had the metabolic rate or the energy needs of an elephant, he would only need four packets of Lay's chips a day. So as you get bigger and bigger, you need less energy per unit of your body's weight. But if he has the energy expenditure of a hummingbird, he would need to eat 600 packets of Lay's chips every day. 600. Imagine sitting and eating 600 packets of Lay's chips in one day. Uh, they, that's how much energy they need. Uh, for, gram or kilogram of their body's weight. So and they get all this energy from nectar or from sugar water from plants. And there's uh, so many hundreds of uh, species or thousands maybe of species of plants are distributed across North and South America that they are important pollinators for. So they serve a very important ecological role. Not only are they fascinating and fast and amazing to watch, they're also important to their ecosystems. And these are the kinds of uh, places you'll find them in. So there's the cloud forest on the left in Ecuador, and there's the deserts on the right and on the top in Arizona. Um, they're also in the high Andes throughout South America. And they also have a range of uh, body sizes and colors and bill lengths or beak lengths. So you can see here, let me see if I can do this. Uh, can you see this red dot? Maybe? No? Yes. OK. So uh, here's a, a really colorful one, uh, the crimson topaz. And here's the smallest of all hummingbirds and the smallest of all birds, actually, the bee hummingbird, which uh, is just 1.8 grams, um, like a really small 10 paisa coin, if you can remember how small those are. Then this is the sword-billed hummingbird. Its beak is longer than its body, the giant hummingbird. <laughs> And one of my favorite, the booted racket tail. Um, so there's really a wide variety. The giant hummingbird is 20 grams. So it's much, much 20 times the size of the bee hummingbird, uh, or a little less than 20 times the size of the bee hummingbird. There is a wide range of uh, body sizes even in hummingbirds. And this body size energy relationship is really interesting. Um, the study of these kinds of relationships is called allometry. And uh, allometry used to start be used initially in the 1800s is when it started as a study and people were really interested in how things change with body size so if you go from an amoeba to a frog to an elephant how do they use energy differently and how do they do other things differently so veterinarians would use this because they wanted to know how much to dose an animal a medicine and by forming these allometric relationships you can predict how much medicine to give a bigger animal if you know how much a smaller animal needs. So these kinds of things are the study of allometry. And people used to think um, that 
all of the all of the animals along across all of the groups would fall along this one straight line. In this case, this is metabolic rate or energy expenditure as a function of body mass. And so they used to think all of the animals fit on the same line. But some later studies found that it depends on what group it is. So birds have a different line, mammals have a different line, reptiles have a different line, um, and they have different slopes. So they increase at a different rate. Uh, so let's look at this in hummingbirds, the alimentary in hummingbirds, because it's thought that they have an unusually high slope. And by looking at animals or groups that are unusual in their uh, way that they use energy, we can find out interesting things, like how are they able to escape what the other animals are doing? How, why are they different from all the other animals? Uh, so to look at the allometry in hummingbirds, um, let's look at a quick timer on allometry first. So this is, you can see energy expenditure is on this Y vertical axis and mass is on the X axis. If you have a slope of one, that means um, every, every kilogram that you increase in your body mass, you're increasing proportionately in energy expenditure. Whereas if your slope is less than one, that means that if you increase by a kilogram in body mass, you increase a little less than one in your uh, energy expenditure. So lizards have a slightly lower slope, mammals have a lower slope, and birds have a much lower slope. So a larger bird is using much less energy per unit of its body's mass than a smaller bird. That's what that lower slope translates into in practice. And scaling, it's also interesting. This line, it, it'll take a different slope depending on what you're spending energy on. So if you're spending energy on really high power muscle activity, like running or for a hummingbird hovering, um, or on the other extreme on things like hibernating, then your uh, slope is going to be close to one. But if you're spending energy on surface related processes, like thermo maintaining a body temp high body temperature or regulating water going in and out of your body like sweat, uh, if you're only spending the energy on those things and just sitting in one place, then your uh, energy expand your slope, sorry, is closer to 0.67. Um, and so hummingbirds are birds, so we'd expect that their slope is close to 0.67. <clears throat> but in the 1990s, uh, one study put together data from uh, other studies and found that their slope is close to 1.21. And this is really, really weird because if you have a slope bigger than one, that means a larger bird is more inefficient than a smaller bird. Um, and you know, if you're if you know anything about economics, you'll know that if you scale something up, like if you're a factory owner and you're trying thinking of expanding, you want your unit cost to go down. You want each item to be cheaper or cheaper to produce as you scale the production up. So this is true for animals as well. You'd expect that. An animal will only get bigger if it's more efficient to be a big animal than to be a small animal. But hummingbirds seem to be doing just that. The giant hummingbird seems to have a much uh, higher energy expenditure per unit of their body than the tiny little bee. So we want to explore this a little bit further. Do they really have a slope of 1.21? Is it higher than one? Uh, this was based on very few species and not covering very many groups of hummingbirds. So um, we wanted to get more data and see whether this was true. And also explore why. why. Why do hummingbirds have such an unusual slope compared to all the other species? So we used an interesting method called the doubly labeled water method um, to measure how much energy they're spending in 24 hours. And people have done this with humans too. It's much more expensive because you need much more doubly labeled water than for a hummingbird. But you can measure how much energy you need in 24 hours. Basically, you feed it to them or you inject them with this double isotopic form of water. It has heavy hydrogen and oxygen. And um, then you let them go uh, after collecting a urine sample or a pee sample. And in that time, when you let them go, they breathe out carbon dioxide and they pee out water. And the difference between the hydrogen and the oxygen uh, in, the, in their urine, in their pee sample, tells you how much carbon dioxide they've they've breathed out in 24 hours. And that's a really nice measure of energy expenditure because most of your processes in your body, the end product for those energetic processes are carbon dioxide. So if you measure the carbon dioxide, then you know how much energy you've spent in 24 hours. So by doing this in the field, these are wild hummingbirds. We caught them and let them go within an hour and caught them again the next day 
collected another pea sample, let them go in an hour. We can tell how much energy they've spent in 24 hours in the wild, pea living. And a lot of people ask me, how do you catch them? Because they're so fast. One way is to use a trap around a feeder. So they come to these nectar feeders where you can put sugar water, and then you put a net mesh around it and let it drop so that you can catch them. Another way are these mist nets uh, at sites when they're not used to feeders, like large parts of South America. Um, so you put up this very fine net like you do with other birds, and you they fly into it and you gently extract them from it. And so they look something like this. Uh, this one's a little ruffled when I caught him. Um, and so we waited and we collected their pee. And this one happened to pee just when we let it go. Um, and then we scrambled to collect that with capillary tubes from our hands um, because that pee is so precious. It has so much data for us. And we finally get something like this. So this is a similar allometric relationship uh, with energy expenditure here versus mass. And so remember, we were talking about those slopes. And in this case, we found by putting all those data from 17 species together that they have a slope of 0.96. And that's less than one, clearly, right? Uh, it's still very high. It's closer to what lizards have um, than to birds. So lizards have a slope of 0.92 and birds have a slope of 0.67. So hummingbirds are still very unusual compared to birds, but they're not defying the laws of physics and energy exchange um, as we might have thought previously. Okay, so why are they why are they able to do this? What is the benefit to them, or what are they spending energy on that it's so you know unusual how it changes with body mass? Um, so remember, I was telling you about this scaling depending on what energy is spent on. This is called the metabolic level boundaries hypothesis, which is a mouthful, but it basically says if you're spending energy on more intense activity or on things like hibernation or torpor, as it's called, um, then your slope is closer to one. And if you're spending energy maintaining a high body temperature or exchanging water, then it's closer to 0.67. Let me tell you a little bit about torpor quickly, because I'll go into it in more detail later. Uh, hummingbirds are able to use daily torpor every night, which means that so because they're running on such a high energy level during the day, they can't sustain that at night because they can't feed at night. They can't see their flowers. Uh, so they have to save energy somehow so if they have to survive to the next day. And they use this strategy of torpor by kind of shutting off all of their body's processes and only maintaining the bare minimum. So they're only spending some 15% of what they spend during the day when they're in torpor. And um, so we know from this, uh, from this doubly labeled water thing that they have unusually high allometric slopes, but can they change how much energy they're spending in a day depending on what's happening in their environment? Uh, so if you imagine that these flasks or beakers are how much energy they spend in a day, if they're spending very little energy, it's a small beaker, and if they can spend a lot of energy, it's a big beaker. So that's kind of the total amount of energy they can spend in a day. Um, is there, Are they able to change that beaker size? And so is, is the same hummingbird able to spend different amounts of energy on different days? We went to two sites in Arizona to find out. So this is one site called Hashaw Creek. It has a lot of uh, vegetational diversity and um, it's also mountainous. So there's a lot of difference in elevation also. And there's a, there's a lot of shade for my field assistant here or hummingbirds to take a break and cool down a bit uh, in a very hot environment. The other site is, is Sonoita Creek, which is much more flat and it has a lot less um, diversity in vegetation. So it's much more open and there's not much shade. And these sites are different because um, I'll just quickly summarize this graph. The Hasha Creek is much cooler and Sonata Creek is much warmer compared to each other. They're only some eight kilometers apart from each other though. So they're not very far, but there's a big difference in vegetation and temperature and elevation in these sites. Um, and we also were able to study them uh, before the monsoon and in the early monsoon. So we have the, uh, this daily energy expenditure data from both uh, pre-monsoon and in the early monsoon. The same for Sonoita Creek. So again, Hasha is the cooler site, Sonoita is the warmer site. We have them in two different seasons. So we look at this daily energy expenditure coming up on the graph. 
and this tells you how much it varied. So this is called a, a box plot, and it tells you how much the daily energy expenditure varied for different individuals. Each individual is a black dot, and the colored the colored points are individuals that we managed to get two samples from. We were able to catch them before the monsoon and in the early monsoon. So this tells us that even at the individual level, they were able to change how much energy they used in a day, which is pretty incredible. Like, how variable is your energy expenditure in a day? That means that how variable is the energy, the food that you eat, in it, the amount of food or calories that you eat in a day and spend in a day. Um, so they were able to change that pretty dramatically as the season changed. What's also interesting is that this other site, Sonoita Creek, had much higher energy expenditures compared to Harsha on average. And uh, in the early monsoon, it had much, much higher energy expenditure than any of the other site combinations. Uh, and it didn't even overlap with either of the sites in the pre-monsoon. So birds in Sonoita Creek in the early monsoon were spending much more energy per day than in all the other combinations. And we don't know, we didn't know initially why that was. But from this, we know that the size of the beaker can change. They can spend different amounts of energy in their day at different times. Um, but where is that variation coming from? Are they spending more time flying, yeah, more energy flying, or hovering or getting flowers? Or are they spending it just maintaining their body's temperature? And is the amount of heat exchange happening, changing? Which part of their energy budget kind of is changing the most? So I track my own. I did track my own time for about, I don't know, 850 days or something like that. And I saw what I spent my day on. And about 5% of my day was exercise, which is less than an hour a day. And I'm curious what the hummingbirds were spending their time and energy on. So the size of this beaker can change, but what's inside the beaker? What are they spending that energy, daily energy expenditure on? There's daytime activities, there's uh, hovering, there's flying, there's perching, and all the other things that hummingbirds do. And then there's nighttime activities. They can either use that strategy of torpor or they can do normal sleep where they're spending a relatively high amount of energy at night. Um, let me just skip this one. So uh, to understand what they're spending energy on, we can construct an energy budget. So we have that daily energy expenditure uh, measure on the right left we've already collected that with the, with the doubly labeled water method <clears throat> and then we can add up its components on the right so there's basal metabolism which is like the basic maintenance uh, energy expenditure so if you're at rest and it's in the dark and you're not doing anything else how much energy is your body spending that's basal metabolism thermoregulatory costs how expensive is it for you to maintain a high body temperature Activity costs, which is uh, the cost of hovering, flying, and perching, and total nighttime energy expenditure. So the, if you add, if you measure each of these components, you measure how much energy it all takes and then add it up, you should get daily energy expenditure, right? Um, so you can fill up that beaker by stacking all of these on top of each other. There's one complication. The energy you spend on something is, is a function of the time you spend doing it and the energy per unit time. So uh, how much time do I spend sitting in my chair and how much energy does it take per unit time sitting in my chair? Uh, I have to add that up with how much energy I spend. I don't run, let's say, but dance. How much energy I spend what times the time I spend dancing? Uh, you have to add all of these things up. It's really hard to get a measure of how much time hummingbirds are spending on different things because you can't just put a Fitbit on them. They're way too big. We don't have accelerometers that are small enough to track hummingbirds with. So we can't use this method that we can so conveniently use with humans. So we have to find other ways to measure their energy and time. And we use this uh, slightly complicated system. It's called a respirometry system, which can measure the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in their breath. And if you'll remember from earlier, carbon dioxide is a good measure of how much energy you're spending. So if you measure the carbon dioxide in their breath and the oxygen in their breath, you can measure how much energy they're spending. So we can put them, like if we want to spend, uh, see how much energy they're spending hovering, we'll put up a nectar feeder. They'll come and feed and we'll we'll pull their breath from the, as they come and feed, and we'll measure the oxygen and carbon dioxide in that. So we can measure the unit energy per unit time for hovering, but we can't measure the time that they spend hovering. So uh, in this equation, we know everything except the time they're spending on these different activity costs. 
So we have to model that uh, and fill it in, kind of ex predict, do some predictions for what the time that they spend on these activities must be. Um, so I'll show you the same graph as earlier, where you have daily energy expenditure in these different sites and monsoon conditions. And we model the time that they spend on different activities. So we we imagine a very low activity budget where they're spending only 5% of the day hovering, 20% flying, and 75% perching, which is a lot of time just sitting doing nothing, uh, versus all the way up to 40% of the day hovering, 40% flying, and 20% perching. This means that they're active for 80% of the day compared to just 25%. And we had a reason to expect these values because previous work like watching hummingbirds with binoculars to come up with an activity budget found that they're spending most of their day perching and not very much of their day hovering and flying. So these models we expected, but these we didn't, we just added them to see whether which one fit best. And you can guess why I'm telling you all that because in the Sonoita Creek in the post monsoon, only the really high activity, this 40, 40, 20, only this activity budget worked. Uh, nothing else would fit really high energy expenditure. That means that they're spending much more of their day in some seasons being very active at high activity levels than other uh, in other seasons, and much more than we thought that they were capable of. Because no study has described previously that they're spending so much of their day being active. What this tells us is that their activity budgets are extremely flexible. They're able to go from just perching most of their time and feeding uh, and not doing too much hovering and flying to spending most of their day hovering and flying and not much of their day perching. Um, so activity was a really big percentage of the energy budget. Uh, this is the percent of the energy budget that that component contributed to out of activity, nighttime energy, and uh, maintaining a high body temperature. So activity was very variable and it was also the highest. But why is that? Like, what, where, what is changing so much in their environment that they have to change how much energy they use on different parts of their um, daily energy expenditure? And it turns out we measured the flower abundances and densities in their site, and it's all about the resources for them. So if there's a lot of resources, a lot of flowers, uh, plant plants that are flowering with the nectar that they need, um, if, if there's a lot of them and they're very clumped in space then they're able to feed on them and just sit in one place and keep eating. But if they get more and more scarce, and if there's uh, if there's less flowers available or they're more dispersed in the habitat, then they have to spend more energy and time flying and getting between them and feeding. And as they get really scarce, they have to really increase their energy expenditure on activity, increasing their daily energy expenditure to find these flowers and feed on them. So uh, it's like, you know, if, they, if you're the only uh, store that you can buy food from is from 30 kilometers away, you have to spend all of your time going and getting that food and then eating it compared to if it's just around, if it's just on the street corner. Um, so the food availability really influenced what they were spending their time and energy on. So <laughs> I spend less than one hour of my day on, on exercise and it's even less now in this quarantine uh, time. Hummingbirds spend between three hours and 13 hours of their day being really active out of a 16 hour day, let's assume. Um, so they're spending a lot more of their energy and time on activity. And it's a very variable amount on energy and a high, high energy activity than uh, I do. So um, we know that the, the amount of daily energy they spend is very variable. And we know that most of the daytime activity is not just perching, it depends on what's happening in their environment around them. OK, so how does this influence their allometric slope that we were looking at earlier? What, what does this have to do with how high their slope is? So uh, if you add up all of this, if you if you get slopes for each of the energy budget components, like you see how hovering energy, energy expenditure changes with body mass as the birds get bigger, or how flying changes, um, you can add all those slopes up and get the slope of the daily energy expenditure. So people usually don't do it like this, but I thought, um, why not try this out? Let's see if, like, just like the energy budget we had for the individual, let's see if this can work on a multi-species level. Um, so we added up all of the components, like that basal metabolic rate, thermoregulatory expenditure, 
energy expenditure, perching metabolism, hovering, flying, and torpor metabolism. And basically, let me skip all this. We got, uh, remember, 0.96 from that doubly labeled water slope. And we also got 0.96 from adding up all of the energy budget. So our model worked perfectly. And what it means is that hummingbirds are able to um, have to spend so much energy in their day because it's expensive as you go uh, increase in body mass. It's unusually expensive to hover and to fly. It doesn't get all that much cheaper energetically um, as it, it seems to do for other animals. So it's all of these individual components, especially hovering and flying, that are um, pretty inefficient uh, as you increase in body mass. Um, how sure are you, someone asks, that you're collecting samples from the same individual? It's a very good question. So we use hummingbird uh, metal, little metal bands. So this is a stand, standard method uh, across birds. They have little metal bands on their feet with, uh, on their legs, sorry, with uh, unique ID numbers on them. And this is standardized across the country. So uh, you know that you're not catching the same, uh, you know that you're catching the same individual on two different days. Um, okay, let's switch to one of my favorite topics, what hummingbirds do at night. So they can't feed during the day, uh, sorry, do at night. They can't feed at night, but they're still using energy at a high level. So how do they manage to make it to the next morning? They use this strategy that I mentioned earlier called torpor. And um, what is torpor? It's where they are, like I said earlier, shutting down a lot of their body's processes and saving a lot of energy. So let me skip this one um, and go to this. So if you have um, humans, we decrease our body temperature a little bit, like one or two degrees Celsius at night when we sleep while the outside air temperature is really low. So this is across the course of the night, and we're maintaining a high body temperature even though the outside air is much colder. Um, when you're using torpor, your body temperature goes down almost to the outside air temperature. And then you can warm your body back up by spending a lot of energy and bring it back up to the high, bo high body temperature that you were in the beginning of the night. So this is deep torpor. And then some birds, like some pigeons, can decrease their body temperature just a little bit and save some energy because when you lower your body's temperature, all of your body's processes slow down. Um, it's like, you know, snakes, they go into their burrows and they basically do nothing. They, they can survive on one meal for three weeks. It's because they're, um, they don't maintain a high body temperature. They just, their bodies are cold. Uh, and so they... Uh, can spend much less energy um, while allowing their body temperature to go down. So these pigeons save a little bit of energy and then come back up at the end of the night. What wasn't known before is whether one species could do both of these things. If it could use both deep torpor, allowing its body in some cases to go as low as some 30 something degrees below its normal body temperature. So hummingbirds have a normal body temperature of 41 degrees Celsius. And in torpor, they could go down to some 7 or 15 Celsius. Imagine if your body at night became 7 or 15 Celsius to save you energy. It's very, very dramatic. So uh, birds were not known to do this, although mammals were. And we wanted to study this because we found some preliminary data in Ecuador that they were doing something like this. They were able to do both shallow and deep torpor. So we use these. Uh, thermal cameras or infrared cameras to study hummingbirds. Here's the camera in this and this, and here's the tiny little hummingbird that we're pointing it at. Um, so what we found is that there's some species like this beautiful blue-throated hummingbird um, that stayed at a high body temperature the whole night. So even though it's outside air, you can see here the brighter colors, yellow um, and red are warm and purple and blue and down here to black are much colder. So in the beginning of the night, the outside air wasn't that cold and it was maintaining a high body temperature. This is the beak, this is the tail, and this is the eye. We usually look at the eye because that has the least feathers around it so you can see the skin. And that's a good representation of what's happening inside the body. So in the beginning of the night, it was warm. Then the outside air was getting colder, it was still warm. And the outside air got much colder and it was still warm. This is at midnight, at 2 a.m., and at 4 a.m. 
And then we have this different species, which is half the size of this other species. This is the black chinned hummingbird, even though it has a purple chin, as you can see here. Um, so this one used deep talker. It went from maintaining a high body temperature in the beginning of the night uh, to as the outside air got colder, lowering its own body temperature and becoming in this, video, in this uh, image almost invisible, as you can see, or not see. Um, it became the same temperature as the background as it went into deep topper. And then this other species, it used to be called a magnificent hummingbird, but it's now called a Rivoli's hummingbird, um, which is about the same size as the blue-throated hummingbird here, eight grams. Uh, it used an intermediate strategy of shallow torpor, uh, where you can see it's not as bright around its eye as this blue throat, but it's not as cold as the black chin. So it was doing something intermediate. Um, and this is how it looks over the course of the night. So these, these are data points, much, much like the graph I showed you earlier. So there's um, the body's temperature was up here, and this is the outside air temperature. And Initially, the body's temperature was high. Uh, this is the surface temperature, so it's a little bit lower than the inside body temperature. But it was high, and then it went into shallow torpor, and then it went into deep torpor, and then it came back into shallow, and then went up, and then it flew away. Um, so this is how the surface of the body looks. This is kind of a, a 3D version. You can see how the temperatures are distributed over the surface of the body. And if we put that to match up with this graph, you can have you can see that the whole body is really warm when um, it's sleeping normally at a high body temperature. And the whole body kind of cools down when it's in shallow torpor. When it's in deep torpor, it's like the whole body doesn't exist. It's just merging with the outside air and it's all of its processes are shut down. Um, across individuals, this black chin hummingbird, this tiny one, use deep topper all the time. So these are these different colors match with the categories. These are high body temperature. Pink is the shallow topper. Purple is transitioning from higher to deep topper. And green is deep topper. And so if there's a lot of green, that means that that species use deep topper a lot. And this black chin hummingbird used it all the time. The blue throated hummingbird used shallow topper quite a bit. It maintained a really high body temperature a lot and very few times it went into deep topper. And the Rivoli's was really all over the place, which is very interesting. It's very, very flexible in how it uses energy. And I think some of this could be one, their body mass. This one is very small, and so it has very little energy stores. And so it kind of has to use deep topper a lot because it doesn't have that energetic flexibility to choose not to use it. Um, whereas the blue-throated hummingbirds are territorialist and it can defend its resources. So in the evening, it can feed a lot and it can save up a lot of energy and then it can avoid topper. Um, because when you're in topper, you're completely useless. If I shake a hummingbird, I, do, I don't do this, but if I shake a hummingbird in topper, in deep topper, it won't respond at all. And they take some 20 to 25 minutes to come out of deep topper back up to being normal, normally asleep. So uh, it's a very costly thing because anything can eat you in that time when you're in deep topper. So if they avoid it, it's kind of, if they have the energetic flexibility to avoid deep topper, then they uh, might be able to avoid predation and they can sleep properly and get the benefits of sleep. Um, so, and keep up their immune function. There's a lot of things that get shut down otherwise. So these blue-throated hummingbirds uh, have that advantage, it would look like. And the Rivolis uh, seem to be, like I said, all over the place. So there's some nights when they use deep topper, some nights when they don't, sometimes they, they use shallow topper, they're just like, doing all kinds of things. So this is true for birds, and that wasn't known before, um, really. So they're able to be much more flexible than we thought. Um, and this has a lot of implications for, uh, for a lot of things, actually. Like, we want to send humans to space, but we can't go into torpor or hibernate. Um, so if we can understand how other animals are doing it and which processes in their body are shut down, then we can target those processes in humans and, and try to the problem is safely coming back out of it. So they're able to do this. And humans, we can't warm ourselves back up if we get really cold. We go into a hypothermic state, like if we're climbing Everest and it's really cold, we would lose our body heat and not be able to get it back up by ourselves. We would need to be warmed up from outside. And hummingbirds are able to warm themselves up from inside. Uh, and this process is really interesting. So if we're able to see how they can safely come out of topper, 
we can understand so much uh, in biomedicine. Like even for surgeries, we'd like to slow the body down and bring the body temperature down and then safely bring it back up at the end of the surgery. And uh, this is only possible to about 18 degrees Celsius now in humans. So if we are able to understand how they come up from seven degrees Celsius, we could understand a lot about how animals can survive these extreme temperatures. Um, okay, they can also pee in this in their sleep, which is <laughs> really amusing to me. This is a picture of a video of them peeing in, in the night. It's on loop, they're not peeing multiple times. Um, and they can also preen or like maintain their feathers and be all neat in the night. Um, and this is a nesting hummingbird female. We had one study where we put up these thermal cameras at nest to see whether females use torpor at night or not. And it turns out they really most of the time don't. Uh, only in extreme conditions they do. Uh, and this has a lot of implications for their chicks because if they allow their babies or the eggs to get cold, that means that they'll develop more slowly or they'll develop abnormalities if they're really cold. So uh, it's important for the females, it would seem like, to not use torpor. Uh, and on some emergency nights, they end up using it a little bit. Uh, so we can learn some interesting things about maternal care um, by using these techniques. Okay, I'm going to sum this up. Uh, so they have an unusually high slope. Hummingbirds are kind of a little bit less of a paradox than we thought. At least they're not defying the laws of physics and having a slope greater than one. But they do have an unusually high slope. And this comes from the high slopes of the different components of their energy budget, especially hovering and flying. They are pretty inefficient at scaling it up as they increase in size compared to other birds. Their energy that they spend in a day is very variable. And it comes not mostly from perching um, at, like energy costs, but uh, from hovering and flying being scaled up. Uh, so they're able to spend a lot of their time uh, and energy hovering and flying. And this seems to change in response to what's happening in their environment. Uh, so I would be really like, <laughs> if I were doing a study on humans, I would try to see, for example, how your activity changed with the quarantine. I'm sure that the distance that you travel per day is much lower. And your foraging ha trips have decreased. So you're spending only one trip a week or one trip every two weeks going to get your um, groceries from the store. Um, so you are also responding to how your environmental conditions change and how you use activity. And they definitely seem to be doing that on an extreme level. Um, they, are, they go from minimizing the energy loss by being couch potatoes and just sitting in one place if the food is available in front of them to being crazy like manic things, I don't know, flying around all the time and maximizing their energy gain and their expenditure when the food resources are very scattered. So they're able to dramatically change their strategies um, depending on what how the food changes in their environment. And like I said earlier, they're really important pollinators. So if we understand how animals interact with their environment like this, we can understand much more about how an ecosystem functions and how that changes with uh, not just with shorter term things like uh, rainfall or monsoon, but also longer term climate change um, by scaling these things up. So the implications of this in the larger context are that hummingbirds have really flexible energy budgets, but I think this method of doing this energy budget and modeling hasn't really been done in too many species. So if we can understand how flexible energy budgets are in animals in general, it would be really interesting. They seem to have really fine scale energetic control both during the day and at night with their topper use, which is interesting on a, on a cellular level, a physiological level, because it means that they're able to change. Imagine changing like what's happening, what your cellular processes are focusing on and changing whether you spend energy on maintaining a high body temperature or not, or maintaining some intermediate state. It's really a level of control of your body that I, we can't imagine having. They're also adaptable to environmental change for now. Uh, I don't know how it'll what how this affects them in the longer term. Like if they're spending so much energy um, on getting between their food resources, does that mean that they don't have the energy to reproduce, for example? Um, what longer term consequences does this flexibility in their energy budget have? We don't know those things. Uh, so I want to thank all the people that have funded me or the organizations that have funded me for this work. And you can find me on Twitter, but also I just hope that you ask me questions now.
and I can stop sharing. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that was really wonderful. That was absolutely wonderful. And it's good to know that the birds are, the tiniest birds are doing much better than guys like us, you know. <laughs> that's a fantastic <laughs> learning, yeah. So, um, questions, uh, please drop into the uh, question and let me look at the chat box. Um, I know someone asked with breeding. Well, one second. Uh, what is the difference yeah. in energy spending during breeding? Yeah. Uh, mm. So, we studied only the males. Uh, in a lot of biomedical and ecological studies, this is a common thing to do because it, females are complicated, unfortunately. <laughs> and, or fortunately, I don't know. Um, so, with females, they're, they're the sole caretakers of the young in, fem in hummingbirds. And they, uh, the males just mate with them and leave. And the females nest, they bring up the young. They, uh, and they, until they leave the nest, the females take care of them. So they're responsible for all of the energetic needs of their babies and themselves. Um, so it's, much, it's more complicated in females. And we didn't uh, want to keep them away from their nests at night. That's, that's the main reason we didn't study them. We didn't want to catch them and keep them away from their nest all night to study their proper use, for example. So, we only study the males. Um, for daily energy expenditure and the doubly labeled water method, we did study males and females, and the total daily energy expenditure wasn't different from males. But how they budget that, I don't know. Um, yeah. All right. Now, there are uh, there's a couple of questions which came up earlier along with that uh, thing on how uh -huh. you actually study ring them and all that. Now, the, there were two other parts to it. How long do these birds live, and what food do they feed the newborn? How long do these birds, sorry? Live. Live. Um, it's hard to know, but from the hummingbird monitoring network that bans birds in the US, they found that the average lifespan, I think, is about seven years, which is unusual for something that's so small. Uh, they live unusually long. But the longest living one, I think, was 12 years, uh, which is really long. I know. And what food do they feed the newborn? We think that females eat a lot of uh, insects when they're uh, breeding, so they get protein from insects and then they feed their uh, young insects and nectar. Oh yeah, okay. Now the, the next question is very interesting. Has this type of study been carried out on other species that also hibernate, go into top or? And what implications could it have on cryogenics? Yeah, exactly. I think, so NASA is starting to, I mean, it seems kind of completely like science fiction and out of like, what the realm of possibility at some level, but NASA has already started organizing symposia to have scientists come together and discuss this. And um, they've, it's mostly been done in mammals. Birds are not studied very often because mammals are closer to humans. I mean, all the squirrels and, and bear are, bears are closer to uh, humans in some ways. But I think it's important to also study it in other species we could, because we can see what the common factor is between birds and mammals and whether they do something differently than mammals do. Uh, so a lot more is known for squirrels especially. We know what genes they use. We know which ones are turned off and which ones are on. Um, a lot is known for hibernation in squirrels and, and bears. And we still have a long way to go before we can do cryogenics. I think uh, to keep a human in hibernation for years will take a lot more work. But already, like I said, in surgeries, they bring human body temperature down to 18 Celsius. Yeah. And so they're, they're already getting there slowly. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. The situation where one or more individuals compete for the same flower, does it lead to conflicts, probably usage of higher energy when engaging in aerial combats? Where such behavior observed? Uh, definitely. They... Well, so it, they could have had a lot of competition for resources. That could have been part of why their flying and hovering increased. But that was kind of incorporated in the models. Um, but did you, but see, usually, yeah, did you see this kind of thing happening? You know, that's the... You see it all the time. Uh, it depends on what species it is. So like the blue-throated hummingbird that I showed you, the big one is very territorial and it will actively push away the other species. And the, the smaller one, the black-chinned, isn't that territorial. Uh, the Rivoli's is in between. Sometimes it fights and sometimes it doesn't. But if you look up hummingbird fighting videos, there's these slow motion videos of 
I mean, words fighting with each other at feeders about resources, and they'll pluck at each other's skin. Sometimes they'll poke each other's eyes. Uh, they can be extremely vicious for being such adorable little things. <laughs> All right. No, that's obviously because they need a lot of food. So it's food that keeps exactly. them going. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's life or death. Yeah, six hundred packets of lace. I will not forget. That. <laughs> that's the kind of food they need. Yeah. That was a great one. All right. Now, do they use more tongue or they have been very active during the day? Um, mm, I don't think so. I think they eat more if they're more active during the day because it's there's a lot of things affecting them, right? They, they have to stay light in order to stay to be able to fly efficiently. If they get really fat, uh, it gets hard. Except when they're migrating. When they're migrating, it's a different story altogether. Um, but so if they're active, really active during the day, they kind of, I think they have to balance their energy budget during the day. And then um, in the evening, they feed a lot before they go to sleep. And this is what helps them stay um, yeah. out of topper at night. So their topper use depends more on what happens in the evening than what happens throughout the whole day. So do they constantly feed? I mean, this is just an offshoot of what you're trying to say now. So do so when do they start feeding and when do they stop feeding in terms of time? So yeah, so very early uh, in the morning and yeah, I you asked me if I woke up early just for giving the stock. I woke, I had to wake up early just to look at the hummingbirds because as soon as it's light outside, they'll go and start feeding. Uh, as soon as they can see the flowers properly, you can see them waking up and going out to feed. Uh, and then they feed until dusk. So if the day is longer, they probably feed much longer hours. And if the day is shorter, they'll feed shorter hours. So it depends on day length. All oh, right. Okay. It's fantastic work that you have done. Anyway, why is there no hummingbird in India? Do they migrate? Seems to be a costly affair, the equipments, or whatever that they were trying to say. Yeah. Why are there no hummingbird in India? <laughs> uh, there are sunbirds in India and in Africa. And they have a similar ecological role to the hummingbirds, which are in North and South America. I think it's just a function of their evolutionary history. Like it's, they just have not migrated here. And even if they did migrate to Africa, they would uh, be competing with the sunbirds. And so they, they are completely unrelated. The birds and the hummingbirds don't evolve from the same ancestor, but they ended up filling this ecological role in these different continents. Um, and they do migrate. So a lot of the hummingbirds that live in Mexico or South America will come up to the US or Canada to breed in the summer. And then they'll go back down for the winter when it's too cold for them in, in North America. Um, and yet the equipment that I used is very costly. Uh, I think that's what that's what they meant. That yeah. uh, the barometry system is, is like some $20,000 and the Infrared equipment is also expensive, um, but thankfully we've been able to use it for many, many projects, and it's uh, it's really useful piece of equipment. So, what do uh, so when they migrate? So, what happens when they migrate? I mean, do their body mass go up and that kind of yes. stuff being done? And yeah, so they they can double their body weight before they migrate. In the pre-migratory season, they fatten up like crazy. Uh, so the, there's the the species that's on the east coast of the U.S. where I'm where I am now is called the ruby-throated hummingbird. And it comes up from Mexico. It crosses the Gulf of Mexico by flying across it and then comes to Texas or Florida and then comes back up even further up north sometimes. Yeah. So these hummingbirds have to put on a lot of fat in order to make that big, long journey. And they go from three grams to six grams before migration. Um, and they use torpor a lot so that they can save more energy and store more fat. Um, and then they make these long distance migrations. Other other species can, they do do some pre-migration fattening, but then they go along Mexico, along the west coast of the US up north. So they can stop over and keep feeding on nectar uh, flowers throughout the, the route. So it isn't as insane as the ruby-throated. Yeah, but the ruby-throated, when it flies across the Gulf of Mexico, does it do it in one shot? Must be, it has to That's that's what we think because there's no like stopover island for them to enjoy the pina colada a little you know <laughs> nectar in the middle um but but we haven't put uh they're too they're so small that we haven't been able to put gps tags on we as in all the scientists i don't work on that but uh, we, if we could put gps tags on them and they're slowly developing to be smaller and smaller then we could actually study their route uh 
we know that some individuals, like especially juveniles, sometimes go along the coast and then go up. Um, but uh, by some theoretical calculations, with three grams of fat, they should be able to fly across the Gulf in one shot. All right. So in which case, while uh, while they are hibernating, the entire DE slope changes. So it isn't the DE slope, but it's the hyper, the torpor slope. Yeah, the energy expenditure just for torpor goes up to one point five actually. So it's much more expensive to be a big bird in torpor than a smaller bird in torpor. Um, but that's fine because it's so cheap to be in torpor compared to not being in torpor. So how many different species are there in North and South America? There's 336 species uh, by the last count. Uh, it keeps changing a little bit because they do the phylogenetics and they look at the genomes and see that species are closer related than they thought or further they split them up and all that. But about 336 species is a lot. And how many have you studied of them? For the W labeled water, we had 17 species. Um, for torpor, I've studied maybe 12 species overall. Okay. All right. And so how many of these 336 actually migrate? Do all of them do? It's really hard to know because a lot, um, we don't know too much about the South American ones migrating. In the US, they, they have this hummingbird monitoring network and they even in Mexico, they put the bands on them and study them so they can catch them in different places and know how far they've traveled. But there is no such network yet in South America. So, and the majority of species are in South America. There's only 16 right. species that come to the US. Right. So we don't know too much. Oh, all right. Okay. So do you intend to go down to South America? You did go to Ecuador. I spent about a year in Ecuador total. Uh, seven months was at one shot in one site, and then the others were short summers, summer trips. Um, and I love Ecuador. Yeah, so you'd have seen a lot more species than what you did here in the US. Yeah, at one site, there would be 23 species sometimes, uh, whereas in the US, there's maybe three or four. All right. Very interesting. Fabulous uh, species here. Yeah? Um, I see a question about the blue throated. Why does the blue throated maintain such a high body temperature? So the blue throated doesn't go into torpor. Um, it it doesn't maintain a high it doesn't maintain a high body temperature in torpor. It just maintains a high body temperature overall, and it doesn't use torpor. So it's it's spending a lot of energy. It's maintaining a high body temperature, and uh, it's able to do that because it has more energy stored. It has some energy in its in its crop, it's able to store some nectar and also fat. Um, you can ask again if you still, if there's something else I missed. Uh, and then another question, does the fluttering speed while hovering vary with the energy consumed? Yeah. Sorry? And do they and do they vary their flutter speed? Yeah, to adjust. And do they vary? The, yeah, so they, they can change their uh, wing beat frequency, as it's called, when they're hovering but it seems to depend more on the body size so as you the species uh, of different body sizes spend different have different frequencies for wing beats but i don't think that the average wing beat within a species changes that much i don't really know i don't think it depends on energy consumed if that works it, it's just the physics of staying afloat while you're a certain body size so you're saying the Fluttering and the hovering fluttering speed remains the same across all the species, which is about what 800 beats a minute or something. I, uh, this is I always get confused between heart rate and hovering. No, um, yeah, heart rate is 1200. Heart rate can go up to 1200 when they're hovering, and uh, maybe 300 beats a minute. Oh, okay. Right. Is the wing beat frequency? Uh, it's not the same across different species. So the bigger birds have to go slower, but with more power, and the smaller birds have to go much faster. All right, okay. Now the next question is, do the bee hummingbird to undergo topper? They are endemic to Cuba, so I haven't studied them, um, and I don't think anyone has, but I would imagine that they have to use it all the time because they have so little energy stores. All right, and... Uh... So how many, yeah, how many different species that you have answered? And my yeah. my query about cryogenics was related to future space travel, interplanetary travel. Is NASA working on this aspect? Yeah, so they haven't 
funded um, anything on this yet themselves, but they do organize symposia to facilitate scientists meeting and talking about this, and that is for space travel. Yes. Hello. Ah, okay. Uh, Chitra Ma'am was asking if they've done a similar study on sunbirds, and no, and that's what I want to come back and do in a few years. So wait for me. Um, do hummingbirds demonstrate a high level of flower fidelity visiting the same flower each time? It really, uh, generalist versus, versus specialist, it really depends. Um, the territorial species can just sit in one flower patch when they're being territorial and feed on the same flowers again and again. Uh, there's other species called trap liners, which are the group of hermit hummingbirds. They're some of the most uh, old groups of hummingbirds. Uh, evolutionarily, and they go from one flower to another to another in the same route again and again. And so that's called trap lining. And they have kind of figured out the frequency with which the flower will produce nectar. And so they're able to time it perfectly to visit all the flowers when they have the nectar available. Uh, so there's actually four main roles that hummingbirds fit in. One is territorial, one is generalist, one is trap liner, and then there's marauder which goes and steals nectar from other territories but in practice they can really vary depending on what the resources are and what their competition is so territorialists can switch to being generalists they can you know they can kind of the roles are a little flexible all right i think another interesting question leading i think uh, emanating from what you just said do hummingbirds show the ideal free distribution model while foraging i don't know what the model is Ideal free distribution model, like uh, randomly feeding from flowers. Is that what that means? I don't know. I know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm also hearing it for the first time. I'm not very sure what this is. Maybe Srinivas could explain this question. Yeah. So let's. Uh, so there's an observation from uh, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, it says in humans, there is no difference between males and females in energy expenditure. Maybe. Yeah. That's true. Really? I thought that males spend more energy per day than, than females on average. All right, I don't know. Uh, okay, why does black chin hummer have such a sharp dip in body temperature during top work? Um, they both can. So if they're using deep topper, all of them can go pretty low, 15 Celsius or, or so. But the black chin seems to do it more often because it has less energy stores. So it's smaller and it can store less fat. Uh, so sometimes we, in one evening, we try to feed it more nectar so that it could avoid topper. But what it ended up doing was just using that energy up. It was flying around, flying around, flying around until it didn't have any energy, and then it went into topper. Whereas the blue-throated hummingbird, when it had more energy available and it fed more ne on more nectar, it would just um, sit there quietly and avoid topper the whole night. They are very different strategies, I think, between the black chin and the blue-throated. All right, that's interesting, no? Yeah. So then uh, this question is, carbon dioxide measurement easier than oxygen consumption measurement? <laughs> you must know something about <laughs> measuring gases. Yes, carbon dioxide. Well, um, easier. I don't know. The oxygen sensor is very expensive, and that's the most expensive part of the equipment that we had. Um, but the carbon dioxide sensor needs to be calibrated with um, known quantity gases. So you need to get a cylinder with a known quantity of carbon dioxide in it, and calibrate the lower and the upper point. Um, and so the carbon dioxide is actually much more accurate and it's a good reflection of what's happening inside them. But um, it's more complicated. Like when I was in Ecuador, we had to get these measurement gases and those cylinders were very hard to get. So it was more complicated in that way to measure carbon dioxide than oxygen. Oxygen, you can just use the atmosphere uh, to calibrate your equipment because we know what the atmospheric concentration of oxygen is. Okay. Thanks. And how much time does a hummingbird spend hovering over a single flower? Do they vary the hovering time in the presence of conspecifics? Yeah. Um, yeah, conspecifics are other spe other individuals of the same species. So they can vary the hovering time. Um, I know this because I was trying to measure their hovering energy expenditure. And sometimes they would spend a long time at a single uh, feeding bout. And sometimes they would just keep doing this. They'll keep doing like one second, one second, one second, and sometimes they'll just test it and then they'll go away if there's some other species or another individual there. Um, and I don't know what determines it. Like I have a feeder now in my balcony 
and I'm watching the ruby throated hummingbird come and feed. And sometimes it's just a quick visit, and sometimes they just sit there for like a whole minute and watch, watch and look what's happening around them. And there's no other species here. And there's very rarely other individuals here. So I don't know if it's just about the other individuals or um, what it is that determines their feeding time. It looks like there's no other questions. Those are all wonderful ones, though. Anything else? Uh, oh, I just lost it. Let me see. We have a comment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want yogis and monks must be using the same process as talk for. Um, it's a, I think this is, I've heard a lot of people say, I wish we could use Torpor, um, or I went into Torpor yesterday because I slept so much. It's not quite Torpor because uh, you got, we can't slow our bodies down as much as hummingbirds do. They, some, like I've, um, with this infrared process, we can watch their breathing rate and their heart rate a little bit. And for some one minute, they don't breathe at all. And then they'll suddenly take some deep breaths. They like, and then they won't breathe for a long time. So they're really shutting down so many of their processes um, at the cellular level that we don't have any control of, um, at least like consciously. Uh, it can be induced in some ways and we can be made to slow our heart rates down by medical processes or by, by having um, things injected into us, but we can't slow down as much as they can, definitely. Uh, but I have seen those videos of the yogis slowing down their heart rate, and it is it is pretty incredible how low they can go. Okay, so why 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 are you coming here to study sunbirds? Why am I coming there? Because I love India. I think that's where I belong. Okay. Uh, Nobody's really worked on sunbirds, right? Some people have worked on sunbirds in Africa, but I don't know about much that's been done in India. And uh, I know that, I mean, the people know about their ecology, but not so much about their physiology and what happens uh, with their energetics, for example. Like, I would love to study hornbills and sunbirds at the same time. Oh, really? <laughs> the biggest ones and the smallest ones in India, yeah. <laughs> All right. And along the same lines as energy expenditure and things like that and talk for and, and find out how this thing works. Because, yeah, that would be a great study, yeah. like you rightly said. <laughs> I think people are working on it, trying to find solutions through it. Yeah. And it's got bioscience, like you right said, biomedicine. Yeah, this whole mm -hmm. study actually influences uh, knowledge in uh, biomedicine. All right, wonderful. Are there any more questions uh, for uh, Anusha? Well, uh, I think not, Anusha. So thank you very, very much for having taken time off, you know, and being with us. It was absolutely wonderful. And uh, we wish you all the very best when you start your work in Cornell. And I'm sure you will come up with something phenomenally different from what's been studied till now. So, you know, which we will come to hear about in a year or so. I'm sure we will do that. And... Uh, all the very best. You take, you be safe. You take care. All right. And thank you once again. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope you all take good care of yourselves as well. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. So yeah. Bye. Bye.